my name is Paris Du Imami, and I'm the host of the Road to Success for Your Highly Sensitive Child. This podcast is about empowering parents of highly sensitive children to nurture their child's unique personality trait and create a path to success. Our podcast provides guidance, insights, and support to help you unlock your child's full potential, fostering resilience, confidence, and a bright future. If you're new to my podcast, please go back and listen to episodes one and two because they provide information on high sensitivity that all subsequent episode, episodes will build upon. If you skip these episodes, you won't get as much out of this and all subsequent episodes. To book a private coaching session with me, please visit my website at parentinghsc.com. Before I dive into today's episode, here's a friendly nudge. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, what are you waiting for? Join our podcast family. Today, I have a truly special guest joining us on the podcast. I'm deeply honored to introduce Angela, someone whose journey has not only inspired me, but has been a pivotal Um, has been pivotal in shaping the direction of my career. Angela, I'm forever grateful for your unwavering support and encouragement. You've been a beacon of inspiration, nudging me to embrace my calling as a coach to parents of highly sensitive children. Your belief in me, seeing something special that I may not have seen in myself, has been truly transformative. Listeners, get ready for an insightful conversation as we delve into Angela's experience with parenting a highly sensitive boy, sharing her lessons learned and insights and the profound impact she's, she's had on her son's life. Angela, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here with me today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. So let's dive in. My first question to you is, can you describe the signs of sensitivity you first noticed in your son? And how did you realize that he's a highly sensitive child? I think the first time I noticed something different was at a daycare party. Um, there was, there was a, uh, at the end of um, the semester, the parents would all be invited to a party and there was cake and sodas and, and tons of kids and everybody was having a good time. But Daniel kept taking my hand and taking me into another room Hmm. and I would play with him in the other room. And then I would say, okay, let's go back to the party. He didn't want to go. Hmm. And we ended up spending the entire party on our own in the playroom Hmm. playing with, um, a stuffy uh, a cat stuffy mm. that he that he loved and actually at the end of the daycare when he was going into preschool they gave him that stuffy because Aww. he loved that thing so much but it was it was definitely the first time that I was like why doesn't he want to be in this room mm-hmm. why doesn't he want to have fun there's all mm-hmm. the kids running around and mm-hmm. laughing mm-hmm. and he did not want to do it mm-hmm. now I realize that he actually couldn't do it mm. and that it was too much, too stimulating, too loud. But at the time, I um, I was confused and sort of concerned by it. Mm-hmm. I think that's when I first started to pay attention mm-hmm. to how he behaved mm-hmm. amongst amongst other people. Yeah. Um, interestingly, just recently, we had a conversation. We were at the end of a swim class, and he mm-hmm. was looking at all the different grades of swimming levels, and he mm-hmm. said. I didn't start at Tadpole, did I? I started at Starfish. And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, well, where did I go? And I said, well, you went to Petite Belene when you Mm -hmm. were really young. He said, yeah, I didn't like Petite Belene. I said, you remember that? He said, yeah. And I said, what didn't you like about it? And he said, it was too loud and there was too many people. He was probably one to one and a half years old. Oh, my God. And back then, he he did not... Uh, cope well with it Mm -hmm. he loved the water he loved being in the pool but he cried every time we went and now of course I realize Mm -hmm. yeah it was not a not a good situation for him to be in but I just didn't know 
Yeah. Yeah. But you know what I love about your story is the fact that you didn't force him to join the kids. Um, you went into that other room and played with him and mm -hmm. you stayed in there despite the fact that you really wanted him to engage with the other children but you honored what he needed in that moment and I'm so proud of you because a lot of parents would see it as oh I need to encourage my child to go and get engaged with the other children mm -hmm. and they may not purposefully obviously every parent wants the best for their child but they may have, you know, encouraged the child or maybe pushed the child to go engage with the other children. So I want to say I'm super proud of you that even though at that time you didn't know about high sensitivity, you noticed that there's something yeah. different. I did try to I did try to bring him back to the party several times, but he would just pull me right back in. And yeah. so I, I figured it out. Yeah, he exactly. To, yeah. Um, he didn't want to be yeah, there. But yeah. I did, I did try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, uh, and when you don't know about high sensitivity, that's totally normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you're thinking that you need to teach your child and in, by encouraging him to join the, t you know, join the others. Mm -hmm. And so that's totally normal. Um, of course, if you had known about high sensitivity, you wouldn't have even tried because you would have known, okay, my child is, this is overstimulating. Maybe you wouldn't even take him there just, you know, because if your child is overwhelmed with that and if it's noisy and your child has a sensitivity to sound, then you would already know, okay, well, I don't think this is a good idea for us to go. But since you didn't know, I think you still from your intuition um, and motherly, you know, just your motherly intuition knew, okay, she, he, I need to just play with him in this room until the end. And yeah, that's really awesome. I love that part of your story. Thanks for sharing with us. I do think that for Daniel, it's about time too, mm -hmm. in that, that if you give him time, he will, he will adapt yeah. and he probably maybe when he was a little older, he was able to go back into a party. Mm -hmm. He needs to start slow. Yeah. He needs to be, um, he needs to have that time to get used to the noise, to the sounds, to the people, to the kind of, in his mind, chaos. Yeah. And once he's, once he's there, he can go in yeah. to, to a situation. Yeah. I remember at preschool, it was a graduation for the year above him at preschool. And again, there was a big party. At this point, I I'd had a better understanding of what was going on. So we turn up to the party and uh, I walked him through the party and out into the backyard of the preschool. And we sat outside. Mm -hmm. He hung out there for a while. And eventually he said to me, well, where is everybody? And mm -hmm. I said, well, they're all inside at the party. Remember walking mm -hmm. through there? And he's like, oh, yeah. He said, so are we going to go in? And I said, when you're ready. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go in. Oh, what I was interesting that. was that he um, we go in and he he starts to growl at everybody. And I'm like, what is going on? So first of all, he goes up to the children and he's like, <laughs> and the other kids laugh. <laughs> but then he's going up to it. everybody and growling. And the parents are kind of looking at me and I don't know what's going on. But I'm like, okay, let's just go with this. I'm, and and I, as the graduation started, I decided, well, we're going to be right by the door because mm -hmm. it's possible we got to leave. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to like try and keep him here. We'll see what happens. He sat on my lap. And so I guess he would have been, what, maybe three or four perhaps mm -hmm. at this point. And um, he sat on my lap. And uh, and he, um, we, he makes it through the graduation. And then once the graduation's done, there's, you know, cake and snacks and drinks and things. He's fine. He's playing with the kids. He's doing great. But a couple of days later, I asked him, I said to him, um, I said, well, how did you feel about that, that party? Did you like that party? And he's like, well, yeah, yeah, but, but not at first. And I said, oh, well, what didn't, what didn't you like? He's like, yeah, there was too many people. And then he said to me, but that's why I became a T-Rex. And I'm like, oh, oh, of course you did. Because a T-Rex can cope. Yeah. Right? A T-Rex is a 
big, loud, strong dinosaur. Wow. So he just became something that could cope. Aww. And so I, I, I was like, duh. And, and so, so things started to fall into place. Yeah. I started to understand what was going on with yeah. him. And again, that was, a, that was a very enlightening moment for me. Yeah. I, I love the fact that um, you asked him like open ended questions mm -hmm. so that you could understand you you um when i'm listening to you i hear that you were curious that you wanted to um you uh, you sought to understand him to see what is going on with him how is he feeling um what is working for him what is not working for him mm -hmm. that's really amazing and um, I know throughout the years, um, I've always admired you for your communication skills. And um, I think it's so important to have this, com you know, the right communication skill, the right, right level of communication with your child, especially when they're all children, but especially when they're highly sensitive and especially when they're boys, because girls tend to kind of talk about their feelings naturally. That's, I'm not saying... All girls do that, but the majority of the girls would do that. But boys, on the other hand, don't really talk about their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really nice that you, at a very young age, you were curious about how he's feeling, which helped him start to pay attention. Oh, yeah, how am I feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, what is going on with me? So it's really cool because in a... Um, and non like I want the comfort and the word that comes to my mind is confrontational, but that's not what I want to say. But you basically asked him inquisitive questions, which at the end actually helped him be able to process his emotions mm -hmm. as well and to understand what emotions he has, mm -hmm. which is really cool. My second question is, what are some of the biggest challenges that your son faces due to his sensitivity? I think the hardest thing is other people not understanding what's going on with him. Um, certainly when he was younger, and, and even today, he's coming up to 11, he, if, if a stranger talks to him, he, he, cannot, or he could not, as a kid, as a child, he couldn't talk back. Mm -hmm. He just would freeze up and not be able to speak. And they would see that as him being rude mm -hmm. um and that was really hard for me because i understood that he it's not that he didn't want to answer it's that he couldn't answer mm -hmm. and so actually we came up with a with a plan um that if somebody spoke to him somebody said you know hi daniel or how are you doing he should wave mm -hmm. just wave you don't have to speak just wave oh that's awesome and so that, that was what he would do. And he would forget, and I'd say, what, what are you going to do? And he'd wave. Yeah. And it was just <laughs> about it. acknowledging people. Yeah. But that's that's definitely a challenge for him with other kids mm -hmm. who don't understand what's going on with him, teachers, you know, other parents, just people that he meets don't get um, his uh his hesitance, mm -hmm. um, that it takes time for him. Yeah. And that it's hard for me to know whether he freezes and there's nothing going on or whether there's a million things going on where he's trying to decide, what should I say? How should I answer? Who's this mm -hmm. person? Or does he ju just shut down mm -hmm. and there's nothing there? Mm -hmm. um, but, but that has been difficult um, for both him and, and for me, I would mm -hmm, say, too. Mm -hmm. um, I try not to answer for him. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I will, you know, I would try to just, uh, how would I deal with it? Let me think about that. I think when he was younger, I would, I would say something like, can you say hi? And he would perhaps say hi. It's almost like, I think if I gave him a prompt, yeah. he could say one word. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, the, the thing that still to this day is, is a challenge is um, people, he's, he's, he's quite 
could have closed in mm -hmm. until he's comfortable, until he's yeah. warmed up. Yeah, and that's normal for and, a highly sensitive child. Yeah. And so what's going on with him is that he's going into the um, fight or flight um, mm -hmm. response. And when we go into that, everyone does it, by the way, and, and Unfortunately, unless we know how to regulate our nervous system, which most people don't know how to do, um, we go into this um, fight or flight response. And when that happens, your logical brain goes out the door. So he's not thinking. Mm -hmm. He cannot think. Not just him, but most people will not be able to use their logical brain when they are in that fight or flight state. So, um, and then the other thing that I picked up on is highly sensitive children, their depth of um, processing again comes into the first aspect of being highly sensitive is what you just talked about, which is we need to first observe what's going on mm -hmm. And then we have this internal talk with ourselves, like, is this a safe place? Do I want to engage with these people? Do I even like them? You know, what do I want to do? And that's why it takes time. It's not because the child is shy. It's not because the child doesn't know what to do. Usually highly sensitive people are very intuitive and very smart people, actually. I mean, as you demonstrated, um, with Daniel, I mean, even at a very young age, he was able to communicate with you in a very, you know, like adult way, which is really fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just that they're in their processing mode. Like they need time to, pro I mean, all of us do, right? If you think about it, when you're processing something, you don't just blurt something out because you're processing it. That's how, what that processing means. You know, you take time to figure things out. And, um, and that's totally normal for a highly sensitive child. I think with him, it's about time. Like it's just, it, it's, it can all come to him. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I would need to take him away, let him breathe for a few minutes, take him back and have the whole conversation happen again. And then that time he, he would know what to do. Yes, absolutely. And that's because he's had the time to process. Yeah. So time and processing goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. they, every child is different. Maybe Daniel will take um, 10 minutes to process something. Mm -hmm. Another highly sensitive child could take five minutes. Mm -hmm. Another one could take half an hour. It doesn't, like every child is different, but it's part of the first aspect of being highly sensitive, which is depth of processing. Mm -hmm. And that it comes in handy in life, actually. It's not, it's not a weakness. It's actually a huge strength. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about it, even in the world that we live in today with all the chaos, all the wars, all the, you know, what's happening in, in the U.S. with the, you know, Donald Trump and all that, um, it's important that people take the time to take mm -hmm. in the information before they blurt out an answer. You know, it's, it's really a, a very um, important skill to have mm -hmm. and highly sensitive people are born with that skill. Mm -hmm. how, how amazing is that? I mean, that, to me, that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think probably one of the first things that Daniel thinks about in any situation is, am I safe? Mm -hmm. And in fact, yeah. recently he just said to me, I never feel safe. Yep. But, and that's it's hard for me to hear. I know, it is. But I, I get it. And, yes. and it's one of the reasons that we try to keep his home life as calm and peaceful as possible because, yeah. because it is a place where he feels safe. Yeah. And, and with him, he, will, he can become safe. Yes, that's absolutely. That's not to say, you know, if he spends enough time in a situation, yes. he can become safe. Yes. But... Um, and then you see him. You see him kind of open up. Yeah. Once he feels safe, but but it is not um, it is not instantaneous for him at all. Mm -hmm. Like he can't he can't decide in a split second whether or not he's no. safe. It takes time. Absolutely. 
again, the first aspect of high sensitivity mm -hmm. is coming into play here. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you've talked about this already, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just in case you want to share uh, some other examples. How do you help your son manage overwhelming situations? So I guess that's two different answers. I think um, if I know that we are heading into a situation that has historically been um, difficult for him, then we talk about it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I will talk to him about maybe, maybe we're talking about a party or mm -hmm. um, a summer camp, something along mm -hmm. those lines. I will talk to him about who's going to be there. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to him about how do you want to deal with this? Mm -hmm. Do you want to stay outside for a little bit? Mm -hmm. Should we go into the back garden first? Do you think you could just walk straight in? You know, this kid and this kid and this kid. Mm -hmm. like, I'll, I'll talk to him. I might preempt, um, you know, I might show him pictures of where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, something to give him time to process what's about to happen. I love that. And that, that works yeah. fairly well, particularly as he's getting older. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't know um, that we're in a situation until we get there, um, I'll watch him. Sometimes he's okay. And he will just stay close to me until he feels ready. If he looks like he's shutting down, then often I'll back him out. Mm -hmm. We'll just we'll back out. We'll wait, and then and then just when he's ready, um, we'll 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 wait right until he's ready to engage, mm -hmm. and then and then be like, okay, let, let's do it. Um, but he's always been a kid who doesn't like surprises. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense to me yeah. now. Didn't when he was younger, but um, but uh, but now I understand. Mm -hmm. And it's that same thing when he doesn't know what's about to happen. That's very um, stressful and mm -hmm. creates anxiety mm -hmm. in him. And so, uh, so yeah, a lot of it is about me watching him. Mm -hmm. um, these days, you know, his dad too has a. We both have a pretty good idea of how things are going to be mm -hmm. and how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't force him into situations, but we, we also, we don't, we try not to let him off the hook too much either. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is just slow everything up. Yeah. We won't necessarily say, Oh yeah, you don't have to do this. What we'll say is let's take our time. Mm -hmm. Let's move slowly. Let's, let's, let's see if we can handle this. Yeah. Let's take, let's see if, if you really can't, you can let me know and we can yeah. leave. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's try to stay. Yeah. So we, we push him a little, um, which I'm glad we've done. Yeah, because absolutely. Because I think, I think it has helped him cope. Mm -hmm. you know, I, my, my hope is that the older he gets, the more he understands what's going on with him and how to cope with it. Mm -hmm. How to decide for himself, do I need to back out? Mm -hmm. Or if I just take things slowly, mm -hmm. um, I can stay where I am. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, highly sensitive people do, as they age, even throughout their adulthood, they do learn uh, coping mechanisms and it changes. That coping mechanism changes as they change because as we grow, as, as we get older, obviously, hopefully, we're all growing and we're changing. And so they do learn how to cope they do learn how to adapt to a particular situation my hope is that that's why i'm doing this podcast is that i want people to know about this personality trait and i want people to know that it's a genetic trait that cannot be changed in that person yes they can learn how to cope yes they can learn to ha how to adapt but why not create a world where they're accepted mm -hmm. And they're celebrated. Why do they have to cope? Why do they have to adapt? Mm -hmm. Why don't we as a society acknowledge them, accept them, and welcome them? Mm -hmm. That's what I want from our world. That's what, I, that's what I'm hoping and praying to get yeah. from my podcast and uh, from interviewing um, people like yourself. Because... One thing that I'm hearing over and over again that you're saying 
um, when you're answering your question is you're using the words when he is ready. Mm -hmm. And that, listeners, that is so amazing that even when you did not know about high sensitivity, um, you already knew as a mother, you had this intuitive power that you knew that you needed to go with your son's timing. Mm -hmm. And that, I bet you anything, has helped um, Daniel be able to cope with, I'm using the word cope just because right now, you know, he, he's not at the point in his life where he's accepting it and he's, you know, embracing it and he's loving himself for the fact that he has this um, personality trait. But when he gets there, it's going to be amazing because you've taught him all the things and you've been there for him and you've accepted him. He sees mm -hmm. that you have accepted him, which is so important because children, even if they don't accept themselves, by the way, I didn't accept myself until I was much older in life. Um, so I'm hoping that children with my help, um, you know, teaching their uh, parents about high sensitivity, that parents will accept this trait in their child and they will celebrate the trait just like you have, even though you didn't even know about his high sensitivity at that time. So I'm really amazed at how you've parented your son. It's really awesome. Well, thank you. You know, it's funny when he was younger, um, he was always quite emotional, but um, the kids at that point totally accepted him for who he was. Mm -hmm. um, if he didn't want to engage, they went and played with someone else. If he mm -hmm. wanted to engage, he was always really fun to play with. Mm -hmm. He was he was feeling comfortable. Yeah, he's a fun kid to be around. That's awesome. But 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 it, it was never a given with Samuel. Mm -hmm. But the younger kids were extremely accepting mm -hmm. of him. It's only as he's getting older yeah. that kids are are. Um, starting to sort of see that, well, I can't, I can't be sure that he's going to be mm -hmm. happy and fun mm -hmm. and maybe he's happy and fun right now, but in 20 minutes time, something might upset him and he shuts down yeah. and the kids don't know what to do with it. And I understand that that's difficult, but I, but I, I loved the kids when he was younger yeah. who were just like, this is who, Sam, who Daniel is. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we, as, as adults and maybe as kids get older, you start to, there is an idea of what a boy should, how a boy should be, who a boy should be. At age 11, he's starting to see that. Mm -hmm. He's struggling a little bit because he desperately wants to fit in yeah. with the boys at school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he, I think he's acutely, I don't think I know, he is acutely aware that he thinks a little differently. He yeah, behaves a little absolutely. differently. Absolutely. And I think he struggles with that right now. Absolutely. As we go along and as he gets older, I want to instill in him that he is okay exactly how he is. Exactly. That's and that other people can change their um, ideas. Yeah. It's not necessarily for him to change. Yeah. So... Um, but I, but at, you know, at this age, it is a time where he, he's less about his parents and more about his peers. Yeah. And that's normal. And so, and so that is creating, um, some challenges for him right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to have a community, um, highly sensitive children, uh, really need a community of other highly sensitive children so that they can see they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I felt like when I was a child. I felt like I'm different. I don't think the way that these kids think. I don't behave the way they behave. I'm different. And I knew that from mm -hmm. a very young age. And because my parents didn't accept me, I thought that was a flaw in me, that mm -hmm. I, I thought I was flawed. And I thought that I had to struggle um, in my life to belong. Mm -hmm. You know, I really had to try hard to belong. And I couldn't be myself. I had to be somebody else. 
And I hated that because I'm, I, I think I was born with the value of being authentic and I couldn't be authentic. And that really bothered me. And I think, um, for Daniel, it's really important that he knows that you and your husband accept him. Now, if he has in addition to that, because a lot of times you would think, oh, well, they love me. They're going to accept me because they're my parents. So you need to have other people that either are highly sensitive or they've learned about high sensitivity where he can say, oh, that person accepts me too. And, oh, okay, that other person accepts me too. Or if you're in a community, even better, because he can say, oh, look, he's just like me, or she's just like me. Oh, okay, then I'm not weird. I'm not different. Um, And even if I am, there are other people that are just like me. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't feel alone. And thanks to you, I have built this community on Facebook that I plan to expand where we have at least um, for the parents, we have a community where we can gather and talk about what's going on and share ideas, share like successes or what didn't work so that we can learn from each other. But I think it would be really good um, for me to also create an in-person where the parents and the children can come together and just interact with each other because For highly sensitive people, um, it's really important to have that community of other highly sensitive people around. Um, This is something that I learned from Dr. Elaine Aaron. And at first, when I heard that, I'm like, I don't know if that's for me because I'm an introvert. I don't do well in big crowds. So I'm not sure if that would be for me. But over the years, as I keep thinking about that, I realize now that I'm talking about high sensitivity, high sensitivity, I'm attracting more and more highly sensitive people into my life. And now I'm automatically creating a community of supportive people around me that accept me, that value me, that love me exactly the way I am. And It all starts with me, though. The reason that these people are coming into my life is because I have loved myself. I have accepted myself. And Daniel needs to do the same thing. Um, But the benefit that Daniel has, thanks to you and your husband, is that he already knows he's accepted at home. Yeah. So that is, it's invaluable. I can't tell you how important it is for a highly sensitive child to know that his parents accept him and they don't judge him and they don't try to change him. That's super important. He has a couple of friends who um, are very accepting of who he is. And I think those friends are accepting because they have parents who understand who Daniel is. Mm. So they understand high sensitivity. And even though their own children are not necessarily sensitive, they have taught their children that that it's okay to to behave a little differently Mm. and still be a good person. So those kids are accepting of Daniel. That's awesome. That's so good to hear. And that's exactly the point of my podcast is to educate people about high sensitivity so that they don't judge people that are highly sensitive, you know, and they understand people because understanding is the first step to accepting before you cannot accept someone if you don't understand. them. So that's really important. And I'm glad that you're, um, that Daniel's, um, uh, friends' parents have taken the time to understand Daniel Mm -hmm. and then educate their children, which is so amazing. Good for them. They're really good people. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) As we wrap up today's episode, I want to remind you that you have the power to create a bright and successful future for your highly sensitive child. Embrace their uniqueness nurture their strengths, and provide them with the love and support they need.
together we can pave a path to success that aligns with their sensitivity. Thank you for joining us today. And remember, you're not alone on this journey. We'll be here with more insights and inspiration in our next episode. Until then, keep believing in your child's potential because they truly are extraordinary. Stay tuned, stay inspired, and stay committed to setting your child up for success in life. To book a private coaching session with me, please visit my website at parentinghsc.com.